Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Kier and co-hosting with me as always is Austin Davidson from Long Island, New York. Hello everybody. We are going to be looking back at the NFL divisional round uh, playoff uh, football. We're going to be looking at the three games that the Pittsburgh Steelers were not involved in. And we'll take a brief look ahead to the uh, championship games that we've got going on. So this week was uh, a, definitely a much better weekend overall than Wild Card Weekend was. The games on Saturday weren't necessarily blowouts, but they weren't exactly close either. We already covered the Chiefs-Steelers game in uh, our last podcast, and that was a pretty good game. But the game of the playoffs happened earlier on Sunday, and maybe even the game of the year. That was between the Green Bay Packers and the Dallas Cowboys. That game caught everybody's attention. But uh, as a result, we're down to only four teams left competing for the Super Bowl title. And uh, this is how it all happened. So starting at four, uh, 4.35 p.m. on Saturday, the three-seed Seattle Seahawks traveled to Atlanta to take on the Atlanta Falcons in the Georgia Dome. And the Atlanta Falcons came out with a 36-20 to victory. It was kind of a competitive game early on that the Seahawks were uh, in a good position to uh, were in a good position early uh, until a holding penalty on a long Devin Hester punt return that ended up costing them 84 yards eventually set the stage for the Falcons to take over in this game. A few plays later, Russell Wilson was stepped on by one of his offensive linemen on a, dro- on a drop back, and he stumbled back into his own end zone that resulted in a safety that cut the Seahawks lead to 10 to nine. And uh, the Falcons just took over from there. They scored 17 unanswered points and led uh, 26 to 13 at the start of the fourth quarter. They kicked a field goal at, on the first play of the fourth quarter. And after intercepting Russell Wilson in the fourth quarter, they converted it into a touchdown to make it 36 to 13. The Seahawks tacked on a late touchdown of their own, but it was too little too late. What were your thoughts about this game, Austin? Uh, I gave the Seahawks too much credit. That, that's what I'll start off with. Uh, I thought their defense without Earl Thomas was still decent and they could keep up with the better team still, but I was completely wrong. They let the Falcons put up 36 against them. Of course they're going to lose when their offense barely puts up 20, there being the Seahawks, uh, 20 points a game. And that's that's exactly what the offense did. They put up 20, 20 but struggled. Like, Thomas Rawls couldn't get anything going rushing. He rushed 11 times for 34 yards, and the offensive line played – just as, as they've been ranked all all year, horribly. They gave up three sacks, including one for a safety, as you said, and the safety was almost completely their fault, too, since one of the linemen tripped up Russell Wilson. It wasn't even a great defensive play. It was just their offensive line stepping back as soon as the ball was snapped. I, I, don't, I don't understand what happened. But anyway, it's just a team that was even more disappointing than I thought. There's not much to say about the Falcons. Their offense played about as well as they have all season, and it, it was a good win for them. What did you think about the game? Well, if you would have told me uh, going into the game that the Falcons would have won by 16 points, I wouldn't have been that surprised. Even though I predicted a close game, uh, you could have easily convinced me that the Falcons were a better team. I, You know, as uh, our listeners would know, that the last couple weeks I never thought that highly of the Seahawks. And while I was wrong to predict against them in the wild card round, my criticism of them was kind of on the money this week. And... To their credit, they were winning and they were in a good position after the first quarter to sort of be in the game. And then that that whole sequence with the penalty and the safety kind of just turned it all around. The Falcons put together quite an impressive performance against a good defensive team, and they did it many different ways. They got 100 yards on the ground from Freeman and Coleman com- combined, and they got 300 yards from Matt Ryan, and eight different players caught a pass on Saturday. The Falcons offense was just simply dynamic on Saturday. The Seahawks had no answer for it. Richard Sherman uh, didn't have a great day on uh, his own individual effort, and the uh, the Seahawks could really only slow down the Falcons uh, for a a certain period before they broke through. On the other side of the ball, the Seahawks really struggled to get the ball moving most of the day. They got no help from the ground game. They finished with over 100 yards, but Russell Wilson actually was the team's leading rusher with 49 on his own. Thomas Rawls had just 34 yards, and without that stable running game, the Falcons and Vic Beasley were able to kind of tee off on Russell Wilson. He did get sacked three times, as you mentioned, but he he never really looked that comfortable, and the, uh, the, geez, the, the Falcons really just took away Jimmy Graham. He only had three catches for 22 yards. He was a major disappointment in this game. 
But when it just comes down to the fact that the better team won this week. That's what I have to say about that. So a couple of key storylines coming out. We got one for each team. Has the window closed on the Seahawks since the, this is their first early playoff exit in like five years? Uh, not at all. Almost all their big name players are under contract still or got an extension. Extension. They're far from being out of superpower talks. Like as the teams that will continue to make the playoffs, they have this off season as well to fix their gigantic problem, which is offensive line. And we'll just have to see how they do in this off season. And just to add, Paul Richardson might be breakout uh, player. I mean, it might be a hot take, but he might be able to take over wide receiver one since. Doug Baldwin is on contract year, and he might not be able to come back with the Seahawks ha- having to pay. They extended Michael Bennett. They paid Cam Chancellor. Uh, they might not have enough money to bring Doug Baldwin back. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, do you think the window's close for them? Well, no, I don't. And the other thing you have to consider about that is that Tyler Lockett should be returning too. So that it's not like they'll be devoid of weapons if Doug Baldwin leaves. Uh, the other thing you have to consider is that the window absolutely it has not closed either. They, uh, I, I agree with you. They have a franchise quarterback who's under contract, and they have their head coach, Pete Carroll, under contract. Those are the two spots where you want key contributors locked up for long periods of time, and it's very similar to what the Steelers have had over the past 10 years now. They've had Ben Roethlisberger and Mike Tomlin, and you know, it's kind of at the point where you learn after that the Steelers' last Super Bowl appearance that it's hard to be competitive and make the playoffs every year. The Steelers stumbled a little bit as they phased out their older defensive players and they kind of retooled on the offense. This is no different from what the Seahawks are doing. Their defense is probably going to take a couple of steps back, but it doesn't mean they won't be competitive. It doesn't mean they won't win games. I think we'll still see them around. I just don't think it'll be... I think it'll be a few years before we... uh, We'll see them being the ultra competitive team that makes it to the NFC title game every year. I think we're a few, uh, we're at least a few years away from that. But they're definitely the window is not closed on them at all. So now looking at uh, the Atlanta Falcons, are they the best team remaining, Austin? Uh, I not at all. I think Falcons Falcons are on the other side and probably the worst team left in my opinion. It might be because I'm a Steelers and I'm sure people have Steelers last, but. The Falcons have no defense. Well, let's just face it. They're the Steelers of last year, which had to put monster amount of points up to win games. And I think as far as it goes, the Patriots rank first. The Packers are an arguable second. The Steelers can, are an arguable third, meaning that I think Packers and Steelers could be switched around. But I, I ranked it that way. And the, the, the Falcons are fourth and hard. Like, I, I don't believe they can keep up with these teams. The, they're just not that good. What do you think? I think the Falcons are the second best team remaining. I'll rank them real quick. You have the Patriots, who I think are the most complete team. They've got a really good offense, and they have the number one defense in terms of points against, so I think they're number one. I think the Falcons' offense is too dynamic for them not to be number two. I know that they have problems on defense, but they did play really well last week, and I think that they are an underrated unit in the sense that they can make plays, even though they aren't statistically that great. You look at the, uh, I think the Steelers are the third best team. I think there's no doubt the Patriots are a better team than them, even with the, uh, even though the Steelers can match up with them at the skill positions. Uh, I think the, I put the, I would put the Packers at fourth simply because Aaron Rodgers is the Green Bay Packers, and that doesn't mean to take away from the other good players that they have, like Jordy Nelson and like Jared Cook, who broke out in a big way this week, but I mean, if you think about Aaron Rodgers, if he plays well and not Aaron Rodgers godlike right now, if he plays like the way Aaron Rodgers normally plays or like his standard, which is like really good, but not like the tear he's been on, I don't think the Packers, the Packers definitely don't win this week and they might not even make the playoffs. So that's not to say that they aren't a good team, but I don't think they're nearly as complete as the other teams that are still left. So... Now that we've uh, looked at this game, how are our predictions for this game? Uh, well, for me, uh, I called Vic Beasley having three sacks on him the day, and he didn't get a single one. The Falcons actually only had three in total. Then uh, this, my second prediction I actually got right. I, I called Russell Wilson uh, struggling in this game, and he would throw for less than 300 yards and two or more interceptions, and he threw for 225 and two interceptions exactly. My third one, I was also right. This is the game I was most correct on, so I'm just going to be happy about it because the other ones I didn't do so well pretty much like normal. 
I call Thomas Rawls, gets almost completely shut down, which he actually did get completely shut down in my book, and getting less than 60 scrimmage yards. I was going to even make this even smaller. I was arguing about 55 or 60, and I ended up with 60. And I should I should have went with 55 because Rawls only got 34 scrimmage yards. But whatever, still correct. Uh, Taylor, my next one is that Taylor Gabriel would find the end zone twice. He didn't find the end zone once. And my final score was that the Falcons would win 26 to 21, and the Seahawks scored about exactly what I expected, but allowed the Falcons to exceed my expectations. How were your predictions? Well, I uh, I had a ton, so I'll try to run through them real quick. I had a, a group prediction for Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman to get 130 rushing yards and 60 receiving for 190 total. They exceeded my expectations, going for 102 combined on the ground and through the air. So they got. 204 yards uh, exactly. They both played really well. Matt Ryan, I predicted, would go 270 yards and two touchdowns. He did one better with 338 and three touchdowns. Julio Jones didn't play as well as I was expecting. I thought he was going to have seven for 107 and two touchdowns. He finished with six for 67 and a touchdown. Russell Wilson did throw two touchdowns like I anticipated, but also threw two, two interceptions and was well short of my predicted 300 yards as he only had 225. Doug Baldwin had five catches for 80 yards when I predicted 110 receiving yards for him. And I thought Jimmy Graham was going to be a much more impactful player with 80 yards this week, but he only had three catches for 22 yards. Also good to note that the Doug Baldwin had 31 yards on his final catch, which was a 31-yard touchdown and a uh, kind of like a garbage time touchdown. Uh, Thomas Rawls, I predicted, would finish with 75 yards, but he finished with less than half of that at only 34. And I predicted the Falcons would win a close game 27 to 24, and the Falcons won more handily by a score of 36 to 20. So, moving on to the later game on Saturday, the th- sorry, that's the uh, fourth seeded Texans uh, visiting the New England Patriots, who are the one seed who had home field advantage. And the Patriots won this game by a score of 34-16. to That maybe was a little closer than the score indicated. Uh, you want to take the recap for this game, Austin? Yeah, sure. Uh, coming into this game, Tom Brady had thrown two picks all season. And in this game, he doubled it. His picks uh, doubled his picks by throwing two, two more. The t- Texan defense tried its hardest, but it was no use. On the Patriots' second drive of the game, they scored a touchdown. And from then on, they just kept firing. Uh, after the Texans got a field goal on the ensuing drive, Deion Lewis, Deion Lewis returned the kickoff for a touchdown, which really crippled the Texans. However, the Texans did continue to fight back after getting a field goal on the next possession and then recovering a fumble on the kickoff, which turned into a touchdown, which at that point, they were only behind 14-13. It looked like this game was going to be closer than we thought, but that was it. The first half was the most interesting part of this game because uh, then the Patriots took off, never looking back and only allowing three more points to the Texans in a 34-16 blowout. So what were your thoughts on the game? Well, this game kind of went a little bit how I was thinking it was going to go. I thought the Texans' defense would keep them in it for uh, the first half, and then the Patriots would pull away in the second, which is kind of what happened. But to my surprise as I was watching, they actually were in this game a lot longer than I thought they were going to be. The... uh, You know, the Patriots had trouble putting together long-lasting drives against the Texans, but there were, as you mentioned, the big plays from Deion Lewis. He had that hat trick uh, for touchdowns, and then the three interceptions from Brock Osweiler really gave the Patriots uh, opportunities to score, and they didn't miss on those opportunities. They converted, and the Texans simply didn't have enough on offense to come back in this game when they they got put behind the eight ball like that. What do you think, Austin? Uh, I thought the Texans kept it tired, just just like you did that, that I thought, to be fair to them. I thought this game would be a blowout from the get-go, and it obviously wasn't since the game was 14-13 at one point. However, I did say the Texans were uh, going to lose by 17 points, and they lost by 18 at the end of it. So it ended up about as I expected, and it was definitely the least exciting game of the weekend uh, compared to the others. So, Austin, uh Brock Osweiler's under contract for one more year. What are the Texans going to do with him? Do they start him? Do they bench him? Do they try to trade him? Do they just outright cut him? What do they do? They cry. They just cry. No, but um, seriously, uh, they need to keep him for one more year, so make the most out of it. Try and develop him in the offseason and do their best to try and restore his confidence. 
because uh, his confidence has to be at an all-time low in that stadium where they're cheering for him to be benched and, and such and that he's bad. <laughs> he, he's got to be at an all-time low for confidence, so he needs something back. But best-case scenario, next year he comes out polished and ready to go a little uh, way better than l- last year. But the worst, the Texans finish 9-7 and seven because I st- the Texans have the most disgusting defense in this league right now because you have to think that if they had J.J. Watt, they might have been able to keep up with the with the Patriots just just because that's disgusting. Their pass rush right now was good, but JJ Watt, it would have been even even worse, and they might have been able to keep up. So I, I say next year they finish nine seven, even if Brock does horribly, and then they can cut him after the season since he doesn't get any more guarantees after this this next season. What do you think the Texans do with Brock Osweiler? Well, they have one more year with them, so I think you have to kind of look at what you've got and try to play to your strengths, which is kind of what they did this year, but I think they put the ball in his hands a little more than they should have. I think what you need to do is you need to look at the fact that the defense is the best part of this team. Use a strong rushing attack with Lamar Miller to try to shield the quarterback who either doesn't have great ability or experience. You see this a lot of times with young quarterbacks. Reminds me a lot of Russell Wilson in the early part of his career. You know, and then with Brock Osweiler, try to get him to understand that he doesn't have to be a guy that has to dismantle the defense every week with precision passes or a guy that throws deep balls uh, to try to take the top off the defense. He just needs to be a guy that doesn't lose them the game with that kind of a defense, something that he struggled with this year. So if he can cut down on his turnovers, I think he'll be better. So now moving on to the other side of the ball, are the Patriots really as beatable as they looked like they were on Saturday, Austin? Uh, no. Uh, they slipped up because they underestimated the Texans. I, I, I truly believe that. I think they will be ready for a Steelers team who some are predicting to beat them. They are in no means an underdog, but it's not very often that the Patriots go against someone where they are being picked against so much. As a lot of votes on Twitter, I believe I saw uh, NFL on ESPN, one of the larger vote, voter ones where you see the bigger polls, it was 52% for the Patriots and 48% for the Steelers. So uh, I think they will completely play better, but that doesn't mean they're unbeatable still. Uh, I think the Steelers could possibly beat them. It just, But just because uh, they played bad last week doesn't mean uh, they're going to play as bad this week. What do you think? Well, just because I think the Patriots played their worst game since they played in like the last few months, that doesn't mean they're going to do it again this week. And that I, I'd be shocked if they played poorly again. It's important to note how the Texans had success in frustrating the Patriots on offense. Bill O'Brien and defensive coordinator Romeo Cornell for the Texans are both former coaches with the New England Patriots. They knew uh, who they were playing very well, and they may have laid out a good blueprint for how to slow down the Patriots' offense. And it's no doubt that the Steelers have a better offense than the Texans do, even if their defense isn't as great as the Texans'. So it's logical to assume that the Patriots are going to have more offensive success against the Steelers, yet on the other side of the ball, the Steelers should have much more success against the Texans' def- or sorry, the Patriots' defense than the Texans' offense did. Obviously, that's just a matchup on paper there, but the Steelers, I think, will still be in a good position to upset the Patriots unless if the Patriots play their very best, which is also possible as well. So, Austin... Let me move on here. How were your predictions for this game? Uh, I, I called Brock Osweiler throwing three picks, one being a pick six, and no touchdowns before getting benched for Tom Savage. While Osweiler did throw three interceptions on the day, none of them were pick sixes, and he did, he was not benched in this game, which really threw off my next prediction, which was to, Tom Savage throwing a, a touchdown in garbage time. So, obviously, that did not happen. Then I, I said that Tom Brady would have a rather down day for him, throwing for just barely 300 yards, two touchdowns, and no interceptions. While it's pretty close on just 300 yards, he got 287. And the two touchdowns, Brady ended up throwing two picks, which was really bad for him. So, uh, it was surprising. Then my uh, final prediction for the score was that the Patriots would win 38-13, and I was seven points off in total. And in my rule, bo- rule book, if it, it, it's seven points or less, I, I was close enough. So I feel like I got that right. How were your predictions? Well, starting with Tom Brady, I predicted he was going to have 325 passing yards and two touchdowns. I was correct in assuming and predicting that he was going to throw two touchdowns and that he would be sacked twice. However, I did not see him throwing for only 287 yards and uh, getting picked off twice in this game. 
LeGarrette Blunt was someone that I completely whiffed on. I thought he was going to have uh, a hat trick performance with three rushing touchdowns, and he was a complete non factor, only getting eight carries for 31 yards. Instead, it was his uh, other running back partner, Deion Lewis, that had the hat trick performance with a rushing, receiving, and return touchdown. On the other side of the ball, uh, Brock Osweiler was absolutely pitiful, throwing for 198 yards and was intercepted three times. I predicted that he would have three turnovers, two interceptions, and then a fumble. He did throw one touchdown and was sacked three times. I had predicted four sacks, and I also predicted he'd throw for a lot more yards with many of them coming in garbage time. Lamar Miller only rushed for 73 yards. I had predicted 60 because I figured the Patriots were going to completely shut him down, and he did not find the end zone, which I thought he was going to through the air once. I thought the Texans were going to keep this a low-scoring game throughout the first half, and then the Patriots would sort of uh, come out guns a-blazing in the second half and really pull away in the second half. They get, they did it a little bit, but the uh, I had the final score being the Patriots 41, the Texans 10. So I was, uh, I was a touchdown off of the Patriots score as they scored 34, but I was also six points off for the uh, Texans predicting they'd get 10 when they actually got 16. So moving on to the final game of the week, maybe the game of the year, Austin. The fourth-seeded Green Bay Packers go into Dallas and play the uh, Cowboys who have home field advantage and knock them off with a 34-31 win. Let's look back at how this game started. The Dallas Cowboys got a field goal on their opening drive of the game, but that was pretty much the only excitement for the Cowboys in the first half. The first half was all about Aaron Rodgers and everything that he's been doing over the past month. He led three touchdown scoring drives on the Packers' first three possessions. The Cowboys blinked, and all of a sudden they were down 21-3. to They fought back at the end of the first half to make it a one-score game at 21-13, to but at the beginning of the second half, it looked like the Packers were going to start to roll again, and they were uh, up 28-13. to But against all odds, Dak Prescott led the Cowboys back, and they came within excuse me let me rephrase that Dak Prescott led the Cowboys as they came roaring back to tie the game with 10 and 11 play touchdown drives after converting a two-point conversion that tied the game with five minutes left at 28 apiece Aaron Rodgers led the Packers down the field to another field goal to make it 20 31 to 28 Dak Prescott then took his own team on a game tying drive to make the score 31 all with a field goal from Dan Bailey. Then with 35 seconds left, Aaron Rodgers somehow got the Packers back on to the right side of the field and on a third and 20, rolling to his left, throwing across his body, somehow found Jared Cook on the sideline who made an incredible catch that set up Mason Crosby for a game-winning 52-yard field goal that upset the top-seeded Cowboys what were your thoughts about this game, Austin? You watched this with me. Were you as shocked as I was? Oh, this is the most exciting game of the weekend. It it was it was just shocking throughout the whole thing. But uh, first, I want to go over some of the, the stats that it broke. This game was actually a record breaking game in, in terms of views. Uh, this game had eight million more viewers than the Game Seven of the World Series, and eighteen more view eighteen million more viewers than Game Seven of the NBA Championship last year. It was the most viewed playoff game in NFL history, and for good reason. Uh, the game began in a shocking manner because it, it seemed like a blowout for the Packers because uh, they were up 21-3. But uh, the Cowboys came back and made it an interesting game, tying it at 31-31 with a field goal and leaving just a minute or so on the clock. Just enough time for Aaron Rodgers to be Aaron Rodgers and drive down the field and uh, keep it from going to the overtime by getting in field goal range and winning 34-31. This is probably completely the best game of the year. I, I'm not sure it could be beaten out by anything else. I believe voted by players, the number one game of the year was uh, Cowboys, uh, not by players, by viewers was Cowboys Steelers. I think this blows it out, sadly, but actually I like that because the Cowboys beat the Steelers the first time, but uh, what were your thoughts on the game? Well, uh, going back to that game, uh, that Steelers-Cowboys game ended up playing out very similar to the way this game did. This was absolutely the best playoff game we've seen so far and maybe the best of the year. The Packers and Aaron Rodgers came out guns a-blazing. It looked like they were going to run all over the Dallas Cowboys when they were up 21-3 to and 28-13. to But Dak Prescott showed some veteran savvy beyond his years, 
leading the Cowboys back on several occasions, only to score a little too quickly on their last drive. And somehow Aaron Rodgers did <laughs> did what we uh, keep thinking he can't do, and he puts the Packers in position for the winning kick. Each time he does it, we, we're shocked, but like I guess at this point maybe we shouldn't be because he keeps doing it. You keep thinking one of these days his luck and his skill, it's, it's not going to be enough, but of course it's not the case. He did it again. So now that the Dallas Cowboys season is over, they lost another home game. They've only won two playoff games since 1996, I believe. So was this a, uh, this season a disappointment for the Dallas Cowboys, Austin? One more time. Was this season a disappointment for the Dallas Cowboys? Oh, no, no of course not. They should be happy with uh, that they have two good rookies to look forward to in years to come and, and trade bait in Tony Romo in case they want to trade him. Last season they went 4-12. and 12. To finish with a 13-3 record with one loss taken when you were benching your starters, that's incredible. The Cowboys are only going to get better with the draft and offseason. What do you think? No, it's not a disappointment, especially considering, like you said, this team won only four games last year. They went a lot further than anyone expected them to go. While losing their first and only playoff game at home when they were the number one seed, that is truly disappointing. They did show a lot of resolve in this game, coming back on several occasions. I think the Dallas Cowboys are going to be a difficult team to play against over the next few years, and they showed a lot to like with uh, Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott and, of course, that offensive line. They now know what they uh, need to work on in the offseason, and that's their defense. So now moving on to the uh, Green Bay Packers, is there anything left to say about Aaron Rodgers that hasn't already been said, Austin? Nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. He's amazing. He makes deals with what he has and just get it, gets it done, and, cre- and it's incredible. By the end of his career, I, I fully expect him to be fighting with Breeze, uh, Farr, Manning, Brady for all of, all of the records that they're going to hold. So uh, there's just not much else to say. Uh, do you have anything to say about Aaron Rodgers? Quite simply, he has it all. Nobody's Nobody plays the game like he does, and nobody's ever played it as well as he does on the level that he does. I think we're going to have uh, – we're going to have a lot more to say uh, after this game and maybe even after the Super Bowl. But as far as right now, until he until he either does this uh, for the last two weeks or until he uh, maybe screws up, there's not going to be anything else to say about everything he's done and how well he's done it. I do think that when all is said and done, we could look at him and say he's probably – the uh, maybe the best quarterback ever. He obviously needs to win more uh, Super Bowls before that happens, but he is on pace to do to break all the records and whatnot. But he really is something special, and it's it is he is quite a marvel. So Austin, you uh, you wanted to talk about Tony Romo. The Cowboys said that yeah. the number one off season priority is Tony Romo. So I guess what is to come for him? What do you think is going to happen? believe them here uh, and I believe that uh, Roma will be traded I believe they, uh, they will have a mutual agreement and won't be like anything bad or so or one side will be confused by it and I think Roma will end up somewhere like the Broncos where he has a chance of winning uh, he could end up as a 49er but I don't think there's any chance I think Roma wants to be on a women, winning team so I think if he, if he were to be traded it, it would be a place like Denver but uh, uh, what do you think is to come with Tony Roma? You know, I just, I don't, it's so rare to see players get traded in the NFL. And while I think he, I guess he will get uh, traded, I don't think the Cowboys are going to trade him unless they receive a pretty good offer for him. And they don't have a ton of incentive to trade him while he does cost a lot of money. It's also nice knowing that you have a really good backup quarterback in case anything were to go wrong with Dak Prescott. I have no idea where he could end up. I've heard, like you said, Denver, maybe Houston. I don't think he'll go to Houston because of all the money they have tied up in Brock Osweiler. I suppose Denver is possible, but they also drafted Paxton Lynch last year. I don't know. I think that's kind of a wait-and-see game. Maybe we'll see something on draft day. So moving on back to the game, how are your predictions for this game? For this game, I think I, I missed almost all of them. Uh, the first one was that Zeke and the Cowboys' offensive line would continue to do amazing things, allowing Zeke to get 110 scrimmage yards and two touchdowns. Zeke managed 123 scrimmage yards, but no touchdowns, so wrong. Then I, I continued to talk about the offensive line and said they would only allow 
one sack and only two quarterback hits. Well, they allowed three sacks and five quarterback hits. Another wrong one. Uh, then Aaron Rodgers would continue to be Aaron Rodgers and throw for 375, uh, 375 yards, four touchdowns, and only one in- interception. He didn't do quite as good as I expected. He threw for 355 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. So I got the interception, and the, yard- and the yards were pretty close. So uh, that was my closest one, I think, for this game. I, I was still off because the four touchdowns compared to two. Then I called the team leading change would happen six times. Uh, this didn't happen as Packers had the lead for almost all of the game. Then this was my closest prediction, and it was I was so mad. For my final score prediction, I called 34-31 Cowboys. I was so close. I would have correctly predicted the score if I just picked the Packers. I was so mad about it. How were your uh, predictions? Well, I uh, predicted that Aaron Rodgers was going to throw for 355 yards, or sorry, 340 yards and four touchdowns. I was pretty close in the yardage department. Uh, He got 355, but I was wrong. He only threw two touchdowns and actually had one interception on the day. I was pretty spot on with Ezekiel Elliott as far as yards went. I thought he'd get 120 and two touchdowns. He didn't find the end zone, but he had 125 yards on the ground. I thought that Dak Prescott was going to play very well, and it turns out he did. As strange as it was, he actually got better as the game went on. I predicted he'd throw for two touchdowns and no interceptions. He threw three touchdowns and one interception in reality. I also predicted that Dan Bailey would hit a late field goal to put the Cowboys on top, and he did hit a late field goal, but Mason Crosby outdid him with two late field goals, including the game winner that eventually put the Packers over the Cowboys. And finally, on the score, I had the Cowboys winning this one 31-28, and uh, I was close, but it was the Packers who led by that score at one point before finally winning 34-21. to So, overall, not uh, not a great day for my predictions, but... I was close for some things. So, Austin, the divisional round of football is over. There's four teams left. You uh, you excited for it? I'm super excited. I'm going to be so stressed out this Sunday. Great. So, if there's anything else you wanted to say before we uh, wrap things up today? Nope. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about our show, you want to give us some feedback, uh, ask any questions, email us. It is stronger than steel podcast at gmail.com. Check out our Twitter and Facebook pages handles STS podcast one. Uh, we tweet and, uh, post our episodes on Facebook and Twitter respectively. And you can check us out on SoundCloud and YouTube under the name stronger than steel podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. For our divisional recap, we will be having a preview of the AFC and NFC Championship games later in the week. Uh, Until then, enjoy your night, and go Steelers. Woo!